We'll call today's hearing to order. Uh, to, the hearing is entitled The American Energy Initiative. Uh, th this is actually the third hearing in a series that we're having on the broad discussion examining the domestic energy resources in our diverse energy uh, portfolio. Our most recent hearing uh, on Tuesday focused on China's, and we noted China's economic progress during the past 30 years has been possible because of a lot of reasons, but one reason that they've been really productive is that they're using an affordable, secure, and abundant fuel source, and that is coal. Not the only reason, but one reason, and they're using a lot of coal. China has become the largest energy consumer in the world and has helped China to become the United States' chief economic competitor in the global marketplace. Unfortunately, in the United States, the use of coal and other uh, fossil fuel sources are being threatened by the Environmental Protection Agency, recognizing that they do have responsibility to protect health. I think we're very proud that in America we have the highest quality air uh, anywhere in the world, but this uh, EPA has been one of the most aggressive they have many regulations in the pipeline, and I think it is essential that we try to have a balanced approach as we look at new uh, regulations. It is likely uh, that some of these rules that are coming down, whether it be the Utility Mac, the Boiler Mac, the Greenhouse Gas legislations, the air transport rules, whatever it will be, we've talked to a lot of uh, utilities, we've talked to a lot of businesses, and we know that there will be some shutdowns of some electricity and manufacturing facilities as a direct result of these rules. Uh, others will be required to make costly upgrades to their units because they simply cannot comply on the aggressive timelines. And then another problem for many uh, groups are, is, is just the uncertainty that's out there because of, the, of what will be required. I will say that EPA, for example, the utility rule proposed by EPA last month is estimated to cost the electricity generating industry $10.9 billion a year. EPA predicts that this rule alone will increase electricity prices as much as 7 percent in some parts of the nation. The air transport rule, they're expecting that that would increase uh, electricity costs in some areas up to 3 percent. And I could go on and on, but one of the specific reasons that I'm delighted we're here today is because uh, of this uncertainty of EPA and the, all the regulations that they're moving, my colleagues, uh, Representative Sullivan of Oklahoma and, and, and Congressman Matheson, have drafted a legislation called the Transparency and Regulatory Analysis of Impacts on the Nation Act. This requires a cumulative analysis of certain rules and actions that are either issued or planned by the Environmental Protection Agency and the forming of an interagency task force. I, at this time, I would like to recognize for a minute and a half Mr. Sullivan, who is one of the authors of this legislation. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman Whitfield. Thank you for holding this important hearing on, on a bipartisan discussion draft legislation the Transparency and Regulatory Analysis of Impacts on the Nation Act of 2011, which I will soon introduce along with my colleague, Jim Matheson, to address the cumulative cost of 10 economically significant EPA regulations and actions. Many of EPA's pending regulations and actions will cost our nation billions, impacting everything from energy reliability, jobs, manufacturing, and global economic competitiveness competitiveness of the United States. The TRAIN Act will conduct an in-depth economic analysis so Congress and the American people can fully understand how the EPA's regulatory train wreck will impact our economy. In fact, eight of the EPA's proposed regulations cost a minimum of $1 billion to the U.S. economy. The time to address the full economic burden of these regulations is now. Specifically, the TRAIN Act would require a federal interagency analysis of the cumulative impact of certain rules and actions of the Environmental Protection Agency on global economic competitiveness, energy and fuel prices, and the reliability of U.S. bulk power supply. It would also look at the impacts of these regulations on state and local governments and jobs. 
Under this legislation, the Interagency Committee, not just EPA, will analyze the cumulative impacts of 10 economically significant rules and actions issued by the EPA. This analysis will help Congress and Federal agencies develop a better understanding of how these regulatory policies are impacting America's economy as a whole. What will, this regulation, what will these regulations cost? EPA doesn't know and has failed to conduct a study of the overall cumulative cost of many of their regulations together, which is why this legislation is so important. We desperately need an honest accounting of EPA's regulations, which this le legislation will accomplish. I look forward to hearing the testimony of our witnesses today, and I yield back the balance of my time. If uh, thank you, Mr. Sullivan. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, for his opening statement. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank uh, <clears throat> all the witnesses for being here uh, this afternoon. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, we know that since the inception of the Clean Air Act, <clears throat> Opponents uh, of the bill have been exaggerating the cost of implementing the regulations associated with the bill <clears throat> while downplaying the benefits that the new rules would bring. <clears throat> I'm afraid that today's hearing focuses on the Train Act may yet be another <clears throat> example of this type of shoddy uh, accounting and uh, shoddy performance. <clears throat> this bill would highlight the cost of implementing certain EPA rules, but does not take into account all of the benefits of these regulations, including enhanced public health, increased job productivity, or lives saved. <clears throat> this bill will also not take into account the positive impacts that EPA regulations have had on our economy, including spurring additional research and development of clean energy technologies, instituting higher fuel efficiency standards, <clears throat> and helping make the country less dependent on foreign oil. <clears throat> Unfortunately, for many of my colleagues, if the benefits of a regulation cannot be monetized, such as lives saved or job loss prevented, then they are written off as having no economic value. At this point, I'm not sure that this bill, as written, would really give an accurate cost-benefit analysis of EPA regulations. <clears throat> the Office of Budget and uh, of Management and Budget examined 10 Clean Air Act regulations finalized in 2008, 2009, and 2010, and concluded that all 10 had benefits that exceeded costs by a ratio of seven to one on average. During debate over the Clean Air Act, there were dire warnings that environmental regulation will kill jobs and lead to outsourcing overseas. Clean Air Act opponents falsely predicted that electricity prices would skyrocket if the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments was, were passed, when in fact electricity prices actually declined in the decade following 1990 by approximately 18 percent. While today we will hear that EPA regulations will cripple our economy and destroy our manufacturing industry, the U.S. Census Bureau conducted an annual survey of the U.S. manufacturing se sector and found that pollution abatement operating costs were only 0.4% on average uh, of overall manufacturing costs, including not just air pollution controls, but all other abatement costs uh, combined. Peer-reviewed articles in top economics journals find little evidence that environmental regulations have dampened U.S. competitiveness or led to outsourcing. In fact, I must point out that the EPA Im implementation of the Clean Air Act and its accompanying amendments has been one of the most successful and bipartisan environmental laws in American history. Additionally, EPA implementation of the Clean Air Act has been a stimulant to our economy with, with estimates that it, is, it has generated as much as $300 billion in revenues and $44 billion in exports while supporting close to 1.7 million American jobs 
by the year 2008, when both direct employment and indirect employment are taken into account, the environmental protection industry is estimated to have created a range of 3.8 million to 5 million new jobs, promoting clean, clean technologies through EPA regulation has the benefit of, of protecting our citizens with cleaner air while also creating jobs and investments for our economy. So, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to today's hearings and debate, and I will reserve judgment on this bill with hope that we're able to strengthen it moving forward. With that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Rush. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think the, the basic premise of what we're trying to do is accept the premise that when you add regulations, you do affect jobs. And you need to balance those based upon the environmental impact, but there will be a job impact. And for those who live in Southern Illinois, we have yet to recover from the 1992 Clean Air Act amendments. Now, I've talked about this numerous times. Uh, we, can, we can debate the beneficial aspects of the Clean Air Act on toxic emittance. What our debate now is today is an overly aggressive EPA that is going further than is needed to protect public health and severely impacting jobs. I have a slide up here which is the impending train wreck and so that's why I support the Train Act to stop the impending train wreck. Now this is just for electricity generation and in eight years here is what's coming down the track. Uh, no, new rules for ozone, new rules for uh, nitrous oxide, a new transport rule, a uh, cooling tower or water, uh, particulate matter, ash, mercury, carbon dioxide. Does anyone really believe that this does not impact jobs? And does anyone really believe that as when you have the multitude of regulations that are coming down simultaneously, well, the, the President's now agreed that it does. In fact, his executive order, which he uh, submitted in January 18, 2011, says that all agencies must take into consideration the cumulative regulations on cost and the effects on jobs. We will submit to you that the EPA has not done that. We will, we will submit to you that there hasn't been good interagency review on any of these things. And we will continue to raise this debate that as you increase the regulatory burden. Now, I will defer to some of my Democratic colleagues who will say, yeah, we're going to create government jobs. We're going to create more inspectors. We're going, to, we're going to create more. They're not going to create private sector jobs. And remember, it is the private sector that funds the public sector. So we can grow government jobs all we want, but as the budget debate that we're having today is we can no longer grow government. We really have to inspire the private sector to invest capital, create jobs, and create wealth in this country so we can solve the problems of this nation. This impending train wreck is real. This is not fictional. No one's made this up. These are all the regs that are coming down the pike right now. And if we are to believe the President of the United States, he's starting to understand that. And now we just got to get his agencies to understand that. That's the importance of this uh, bipartisan piece of legislation that I hope we continue to have hearings on and move to the floor because as I've said numerous times and I didn't bring my placard of the uh, coal miners who lost their job in, in the last round of, of the Clean Air Act amendments, uh, that one mine of a thousand miners closed never to reopen. Never to reopen. It is, it is closed today and that rural community, small town, has never recovered from the Clean Air Act amendments of 92. So uh, I would say that it is very important to make sure that we continue to have this debate 
of the cost-benefit analysis. And the importance about this debate in this hearing is the cumulative effect of all these aspects, this train wreck of eight different rules and regulations specifically targeting coal, electricity generation by coal, raising energy costs, killing our coal mines, making energy costs higher. With that, I appreciate Mr. Woodfield uh, giving me the time. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from California, ranking member, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The legislation before us today has a worthwhile purpose. We should always try to understand as fully as possible the ramifications of federal laws and regulations. Where regulations have a cumulative impact, that should be understood as well. But it is important that we recognize the potential cost of overanalysis. We can reach a point where the cost to the taxpayers of additional analysis exceeds its value. Our goal should be to strike the right balance. We must also ensure that any analysis we require can be credibly executed. Ideally, we may want to know the effect of a proposed rule far into the future, but that may simply be too speculative an exercise to add value to the decision making. And we need to make sure any analysis is fair and objective. We can't look just at the costs of federal regulation without considering its benefits, just that we wouldn't look at only at the benefits without considering the costs. As we consider this proposal from these perspectives, I want to flag several issues. From a practical point of view, we need to make sure this bill is workable. In its current form, the legislation asks asks 12 administration officials and one industry representative to collect and analyze information about actions that may or may not be taken by state and local governments, including 110 state and local permitting agencies, and project the impacts of those actions 20 years into the future. They are supposed to do this without staff, without the authority to collect information, and within 30 days. Another issue to flag is balance. The draft requires an extensive analysis of regulatory costs, but we need to understand the benefits as well so Congress and the public can, can get a balanced assessment of the value of the regulations. Further, we need to be mindful not to duplicate what is already being done. For every final rule covered by this act, the EPA has prepared a regulatory impact analysis to satisfy the requirements of OMB policy, executive orders, and statutes, including the Administrative Procedure Act, the Paperwork Reduction Act, the Regulatory Flexibility Act, and the Small Business Regulatory Enforcement Fairness Act. We need to make sure we're not requiring a redundant analysis. Finally, this legislation creates new requirements for the executive branch without providing a specific authorization. It also does not offset these new requirements by relieving the agencies of other offsetting obligations. These are some of the issues that will be on my mind as we consider this bill today and in the weeks ahead. And I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses, and I hope this legislation can be improved through the uh, committee process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back my time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Waxman. At this time, uh, I'm going to introduce the panel of witnesses, and we're going to start with Mr. Uh, Colley will be first. But before we do that, I do want to introduce the entire panel and thank you again for being with us to help us analyze uh, where we are today. First, we have Mr. Gary Colley, President and CEO, North American Reliability Administration. Second of all, Mr. Eric Schaefer. Executive Director, the Environmental Integrity uh, Project. Third, we have Mr. Mark Bailey, who's the President and CEO of Big Rivers Electric Corporation. Fourth, we have Mr. Timothy Hess, who's the Division Vice President of Glattfelter. We have Dr. Robin Ridgway, who's the Director of Environmental Health, Safety, and Regulatory Compliance at Purdue University. Six, we have Ms. Ms. Rena Stenzer, who's the president of the Center for Progressive Reform. And then seventh, we have Mr. Scott Siegel, 
who is the director of the Electric Reliability Coordinating Council. So thank you all for being with us. Uh, each one of you will be introduced for a five-minute uh, statement, and there's a little panel on, your, on the table there, which hopefully you can see. It will show you a yellow light when you have a minute left and red when your time's expired. So, Mr. Colley, you're recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, Chairman Whitfield, members of the subcommittee, and fellow panelists. My name is Jerry Colley. I am President and CEO of the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. I'm a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy, former officer in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and I have over 30 years' experience in the electric power industry. I have with me today Vice President and Director of Reliability Assessments, Mark Lobby, and I would ask uh, perhaps if there's technical questions on our report. He was the author of the report. I, I may uh, request permission to uh, call on him as needed. There are two words that resonate through everything that NERC does, reliability and accountability. Our mission is to ensure the reliability of the bulk power system through our mandatory standards, through our assessments, and by promoting a culture of a learning industry. We're accountable to the government, to industry, and ultimately to consumers for ensuring a reliable bulk power system. By assessing and analyzing historic, current, and future conditions, as well as emerging issues affecting the bulk power system reliability, NERC develops vital information for managing current and future reliability risks and for improving reliability performance. In the nearly five years since NERC was certified as the Electric Reliability Organization by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, NERC has made significant progress, particularly in the area of reliability assessments. NERC produces a yearly long-term report with a 10-year horizon, two annual seasonal reports for the winter and summer seasons, and special assessments as needed. These reliability assessments are conducted to provide an independent evaluation of industry's plans to ensure a future reliability of the bulk power system and to identify trends, emerging issues, and potential, potential concerns. In October 2010, NERC released a report titled 2010 Special Reliability Scenario Assessment, Resource Adequacy Impacts of Potential U.S. Environmental Regulations. The focus of this assessment was to quantify the potential impacts of pending and planned EPA regulations on future resource adequacy. The report was intended to inform NERC stakeholders, industry leaders, policymakers, regulators, and the public so that sound and informed decisions can be made. It is NERC's responsibility as the ERO to assess and highlight bulk power system reliability considerations resulting from emerging system conditions or external events to ensure that suitable plans are put in place to ensure reliability. NERC scenarios address, addressed four rules under consideration at the time of our assessment. Section 316B, the MAC standard, uh, CATER, and CCR. We evaluated both strict and moderate cases for each rule to provide sensitivities to the assumptions that we use. Because more than one regulation pertains to any given uh, power plant, NERC performed an economic assessment of these regulations both individually and cumulatively in, in the aggregate. Some of the findings of the assessment based on the rules under consideration during our study uh, include for the strict case, for the strict scenario, up to a 78 gigawatt reduction in coal, oil, and gas fire generation capacity could be seen based on resource plans existing at the time of the study. Section 316B would have had the greatest potential for impact on reserve margins. The, the EPA regulations, if implemented as planned or proposed at the time we completed our assessment, would create a need for prompt industry response and action to address future resource requirements. Without attention to these findings, the study identified bulk power system reliability impacts resulting from reduced reserve margins in certain areas of the United States. We believe the potential reliability implications of these regulations can be managed through timing, tools, and coordination. The timing of the industry's obligations for compliance with environmental regulations is the most important consideration. The industry needs both time and certainty of its obligations in order to act and make informed investment decisions. NERC identified a number of tools the industry and regulators have for mitigating the potential reliability impacts, such as advancing in-service dates of future generation and implementing more demand response and energy efficiency. The EPA, FERC, the Department of Energy, and state regulators should employ their, the entire array of tools at their disposal to moderate reliability impacts, including granting extensions needed to install emissions controls, and add additional supplier demand resources as needed. Thirdly, industry coordination will be vital 
to ensure retrofits are completed in a way that addresses all of the operational challenges. Since our study, the EPA has issued proposed rules for Utility Act and 316B. NERC is reviewing the proposed rules, and if there are significant differences from our 2010 report, an assessment would likely be uh, provided in our uh, annual assessment released in November. NERC will continue to monitor the implications of the EPA regulations as greater certainty emerges around these industry obligations and our requirements. The, uh, and I thank you for your interest in NERC's findings and its report, and I sincerely uh, uh, appreciate your interest in reliability and the opportunity <coughs> to answer your questions today. Thank you. And thank you very much. And uh, you recognize uh, Mr. Uh, Schaefer, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. I'm Eric Schaefer, Director of the Environmental Integrity Project. We advocate for more effective enforcement of environmental law, and I also served at EPA as head of the Office of Civil Enforcement until 2002. I'd like to briefly summarize uh, my testimony and then maybe cover a couple of points uh, I've heard so far in the hearing. Um, the, the regulations that are the uh, subject of the bill, the object of the bill, have already been exhaustively analyzed. The regulatory impact analyses are dense documents. They are available for anybody to review. Um, and if people want to aggregate those costs, the information is there. Um, you know, I do understand the importance of, of bringing jobs back to communities and holding on or hopefully rebuilding manufacturing in the U.S. That's obviously a very important goal. Um, I've, I have heard uh, a lot of mention of balance, and you know, I, I have to say that a, a bill that would require the government to consider the costs but not the benefits of regulations you know, really doesn't seem to meet a balance test, um, at least on the, on the face of it. So I hope you will, you will consider that as you proceed. Um, second point I want to make is we've heard about train wrecks. Um, I'd like to suggest that these uh, rules are, are more like a set of uh, creaky hand carts that are finally lumbering across the finish line, in some cases decades after they were supposed to have been put on the books, and I'll give you some examples. Um, and th this, is, this gets to the issue of time, time, we need more time. Um, again, these laws have been on the books forever. Um, we have very competent counsel for industry that can read the deadlines and understand what it is they've had to do. Um, EPA made a decision to regulate hazardous air emissions from power plants in December of 2000. Under the Clean Air Act, those standards should have been met no later than December of 2005. We're now looking at compliance in 2015, so that's nine years later. Uh, industrial boilers, deadline 2004 in laws written by Congress. Um, emission limits will have to be met in 2014. So that's about 10 years after the congressional deadline. 1984, you, the Congress, told EPA to do something about coal ash. We're still waiting for an answer 26 years later. The intake rule that we're talking about, when were those standards due? 1977, back when I still had hair on my head uh, and, and was still just getting out of school. So these are very old rules. And the image of speeding trains, um, to anybody who's sort of ground away on these regulations over the decades, just um, doesn't fit reality. The industry's had lots of time to plan. The reason I think you're seeing them come back and ask for this reanalysis of what's already been analyzed is these rules have all gone to court, or will go to court, and in a couple cases have gone to court. The industry has lost. Um, the court has told EPA what it has to do and EPA is doing it. So in the end, if you want to stop these actions, you need to change the laws, because what EPA is doing is executing the laws that you gave them and doing just what the courts have told them to do. If anybody thinks that's incorrect, they can take the agency to court, as they do almost every day, and try their luck. Uh, in several cases here, the industry has done that and lost. I should add that some of these decisions have come from very conservative judges who believe in taking literally what Congress tells the agency to do. So if you, if you think the balance is wrong, if you think there's too much emphasis on health and not enough on cost to industry, then those laws can be changed 
Um, in that case, we'll have an open debate. Everybody can see what we're doing. Um, you can decide whether uh, approximately 9,000 to 23,000 premature deaths a year uh, counts more or less than the economic cost of this legislation on, on particular industries. And I, I respect that these are very difficult choices. They're, they're very tough. Um, may, maybe they deserve to be debated, but I hope they will be. Last point on jobs, I hope you'll consider the impact that cleaning up these plants has on employment. Um, we've had lots of public um, releases from the power industry bragging about the number of jobs created every time one of these plants is cleaned up. From Synergy, um, this will create more than 1,000 construction jobs in Indiana and Ohio, and Ohio to put a scrubber on. Um, from DTE in Michigan, the $600 million project will create 900 jobs and be one of the largest construction projects in Michigan over the next few years. So it, there is work involved in complying with these laws, not just government inspectors, people on the ground, and I hope you'll consider that also. Thank you for my time. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Uh, Mr. Bailey, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Mark Bailey, and I'm the president and CEO of Big Rivers Electric Corporation. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss Big Rivers' assessment of the impacts of the proposed EPA regulations on electric reliability, the cost of electricity, and our customers. Big Rivers is a not-for-profit cooperative, and we generate and transmit power in, and we're located in western Kentucky. The three distribution cooperatives who own us serve collectively 113,000 customers, both residents and businesses. We are a small company. We own 1,500 megawatts of generating capacity, and 97 percent of the electricity we produce comes from coal-fired generators. We believe that we've taken a proactive approach in meeting our environmental obligations by equipping essentially our entire fleet with SO2 and NOx controls. However, compliance with pending EPA regulations identified in Section 3E of the legislation before this committee will be very difficult for us in the near term due to the piecemeal and staggered approach the EPA is using in issuing these contemplated regulations. At this time, affected electric utilities do not have all the information needed to make informed and cost-effective decisions. While the proposed clean air transport rule and the hazardous air pollutants rules may enable electric generators to use some common control equipment to satisfy both of those rules, we'll still be waiting for the coal combustion residual rule to come out a little later. And depending on what the, is required there, whether ash is classified as hazardous or not, can tip the scales in one fashion or another as far, as far as what we would do to comply with the two earlier rules that need to be complied with on an earlier date. So it's possible you have to make a decision and gamble on, on doing the right thing to comply with the two earlier deadline rules and hope that, that that doesn't change when the final rule comes out. Or you can gamble and wait and see uh, what the entire rules look like, but then you run the risk of not meeting the earlier deadline requirements. In addition to this concern, compliance timelines are unreasonably short and virtually impossible to achieve. Because of this, many utilities will be racing simultaneously to comply, which will exacerbate the cost concerns as we compete for scarce resources to get all these facilities built in a very narrow window. The cumulative effect of EPA's next series of regulations will result in significant financial and economic impacts to Western Kentucky. A particular concern for our region and perhaps the entire nation is the potential loss, excuse me, of aluminum smelters and other strategic electric intensive industries due to electric rate increases. Seventy percent of the energy that Big Rivers produces is used by two of only four aluminum smelters still operating in this country at 100 percent capacity. Not only do the smelters employ 1,400 people and pay relatively high wages, the satellite industries in our region that serve them collectively employ altogether 5,000 individuals and the annual payroll list is about $200 million and there's an additional $17 million in state and local taxes. To, ha to help put this in context, over the past five years, at least 12 U.S. aluminum smelters have shut down, 
and five have curtailed their operations. These actions are largely attributable to rising electricity rates along with global competition. Any significant increase in rates will threaten the ability of these smelters to continue to operate in Kentucky and perhaps the rest of the country as well. I believe the future impact of the EPA's proposed regulations will ultimately increase electric costs, could negatively affect reliability, at least in the short term, may reduce employment, and weaken the global competitiveness of the American manufacturing industry. In closing, Big Rivers estimates compliance costs with the impending EPA regulations will increase our rates 40 percent at the wholesale level by 2015. The piecemeal approach that EPA is taking in issuing its regulations and then the staggered and compressed time fr frame to comply could result in unnecessary and additional spending and suboptimal results. At a minimum, we respectfully request that the committee consider delaying the implementation of EPA regulations until all planned regulations have been promulgated so that affected utilities can analyze them on a holistic and informed basis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Uh, we do have uh, votes on the floor. Unfortunately, uh, we like to have these hearings in the morning, so we're not detaining everyone. But, uh, Ms. Tress, we're going to go on and get your five-minute opening statement in, and then we're going to recess. Uh, I'll find out how many votes we have, but you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, members of the subcommittee, my name is Tim Hess. I'm the Vice President of Engineered and Converting Products with Gladfelder, a specialty paper company that has been in business since the Civil War. I'm a graduate of the United States Military Academy, and I've been in the paper business for 16 years. I am testifying today on behalf of the American Forest and Paper Association. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the challenges presented by the cumulative impact of the EPA regulations on manufacturers. We applaud this subcommittee and others for taking seriously the oversight of the laws that have been enacted. The forest products manufacturing supply chain will continue to adapt to well-reasoned regulations that are affordable and achievable. We are proud of our environmental stewardship, but we cannot respond to regulations in a vacuum. Businesses in our sector must consider the global competitive environment in which they operate. They must compete for capital globally and have the time needed to build new regulatory requirements into the capital planning process. They must also be able to rely on the government so that once a regulation is in place, it will not be selectively enforced or changed within a short time frame. Paper and wood products manufacturers are facing over 20 major regulations from EPA's Clean Air Act program alone. The pace and volume of regulation is not sustainable for the agency, the states, the companies that are required to meet them, or the Congress whose obligation it is to provide oversight. I'd like to call your attention to the diagram that I included with my written testimony of the clean air regulations in the pipeline that will affect forest products industry manufacturing facilities. Uh, it's similar to the train wreck picture that was previously uh, shown. A picture is worth a thousand words. And this picture gives you an idea of the complicated maze of current EPA regulatory activity and doesn't even take into account the hundreds of other regulations that we comply with every day. As detailed in my written statement, this type of regulatory environment increases our costs, makes us less competitive in a global basis, and ultimately results in lost jobs. The forest products industry, like so many other manufacturing industries, has been hard hit by the economic crisis. Since 2006, when the housing downturn began, the forest products industry has lost 31 percent of its workforce. Nearly 400,000 high-paying jobs, largely in small rural communities that can least afford to lose them. The closure of a mill in a small town has a significant ripple effect when that mill is the largest employer and a major contributor to the local taxes and community programs. Here are a few of the many regulations we are concerned about. Boiler Mact. EPA's recently finalized Boiler Mact rule will cost our indus industry alone well over $3 billion and continues to ignore what real-world, best-performing boilers can achieve over the range of normal operating conditions. And while con Congress authorized EPA to adopt a health-based performance approach to target controls for certain emissions below the level of concern, EPA decided not to use this authority and reversed its previous precedent. EPA is also considering redoing the pulp and paper max issued a decade ago. Even though MACT is supposed to be a one-time program, and we are concerned that this could add an additional $4 billion in capital cost beyond Boiler MACT. 
The National Ambient Air Quality Standards, known as NACS, program has greatly reduced emissions of criteria pollutants, yet further tightening is underway. Even before the latest ozone standard has been fully implemented, EPA is tightening it further, two years ahead of the usual statutory schedule. Collectively, the, res the revisions of all the NAAQS rules could cost the forest products industry over $8 billion in capital cost. These constantly changing air quality regulations do not allow me and my management team to make rational long-term decisions about capital spending, particularly for projects that, that do not return profits to the bottom line. We applaud the subcommittee's efforts to shine a light on the impacts of the EPA regulations. As recognized in the TRAIN Act, agencies typically look at any given regulation in a stovepipe and fail to consider the cumulative regulatory impact on competitiveness and jobs. Accordingly, the subcommittee may want to consider the impacts of regulation on the loss of human capital such as when worker skills are no longer marketable because manufacturing jobs are lost in the U.S. This could include real costs such as lost wages and the cost of new job training, and they could be added to the compliance cost in the analysis. In summary, we know that the current wave of pending new regulations is unsustainable. Living with such an uncertain regulatory environment not only costs current jobs, but also prevents new jobs from being created. Companies frequently find themselves tangled in a web of rules that result in a decision not to make an investment because of uncertainty about the regulatory process or they decide to invest overseas. Others roll the dice hoping that the rule they are making decisions under will today will still be in place when their project is complete. Investments in energy efficiency projects, mill modernization programs, and new biomass boilers have already been impacted by Boilermacht and NACs. Unfortunately, it is easier to see the jobs that are lost after the fact, but the greatest damage may be the unknowable. The projects never built, the products never made, the jobs never created, or the entrepreneurial ideas drowned in a sea of red tape. Thank you for taking the time to listen to some of the many regulatory challenges the forest products industry is facing. Mr. Hess, thank you, and uh, I apologize once again. Uh, we do have five votes, and. I would expect it'll probably take 45, 50 minutes at, at a minimum. So uh, there are, there's a deli downstairs. <laughs> there's a restaurant. So I hope that you all can find something to entertain yourself till we get back. But once again, thank you. All right. It's 10 till 2, so we'll, we'll certainly try to be back at about 15 till 3.